Thank you. Um, thanks to Fernando for inviting me. This has been a very pleasant visit here the past few months. Um, so so let me start by um, giving a sort of a shorter title. <laughs> so so the, what I want to present is some work, in some sense sort of ongoing, uh, but uh, focused on understanding branch points of uh, some stationary variables. So these are sort of very special, sort of somewhat special classes of waterfalls and, and at special points where the branch points happen. So you know, in some sense, sort of the simplest things you can you can try to try to do. And obviously, <coughs> many people are aware that the stationary waterfall, just under just stationarity, it, 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 almost nothing is known beyond what Alad's regularity says, which is that the regular set is open and dense. And um, so the singular set, in, in principle, could be could be very large, even have positive positive and dimensional measure. All we know. So and and, and the key difficulty is <coughs> is sort of understanding um, set of branch points. By that I mean set of points where the ta one tangent cone is a plane with some high multiplicity, and yet the uh, the uh, the waterfall is not not immersed at that point. Okay. So this. There are various examples showing that that, that that sort of thing can happen. So um, l l let me let me start by kind of writing down some very specific examples to to keep in mind in, in, in this talk. Um, sort of let, let's make a list of things. So what, what kind of we're, we're going to be in any dimension and co-dimension um, for a while. So l let's just. So examples. So first is a, a pair of planes, uh, transverse planes. So the, everything I write down these examples are stationary. Okay, so they have singularities. So one simple example is this. So P1, P2. These are n-dimensional planes. So union of transverse union of. Two n-dimensional planes in some higher dimensional um, ambient. So I'll say uh, n plus k. I'll use the letter k <coughs> for for co-dimension. Now, so in this example, so the the the, the axis, so the intersection, so the dimension of the the subspace along which they intersect could be anywhere, it could be anything between 0 and n minus 1. Okay, I'm only insisting stationarity, right? no minimizing or anything like that. Okay, so that's that's my first example to keep in mind. Th these will arise as singularity models, right, in, 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 in the general case. And the second one is I can I can modify this in higher co-dimension. So the second one is I'm going to start by looking something one-dimensional, so which is sort of two two line segments. Let's say unit vector u1, u2, and then because if I'm in higher co-dimension, I have a lot of freedom to put two other vectors such that the balancing condition is satisfied here, and yet the plane defined by these two is different from the plane defined by the other two. So you can put a twist. So you can start by, you know, if you want to visualize this in R3, you start by something that's, that lies on a plane and then you twist the, this side only around this axis. Okay. The balancing condition is still met, so it's stationary, but now you have a, uh, sort of a genuine singularity. It's not immersed. 
So that's the picture. So it's kind of hard to draw the picture. I hope you get the idea. So I'll just draw it sort of maybe like this. So the angles, you know, they're, they're, they're supposed to lie in different planes. Okay, so four. So this is stationary in 1D, so I can, of course, I can put this in any space with co-dimension uh, uh, big O equal to 2. So let's just stick with the same co-dimension, this is k plus 1. And then, of course, now I can take, take this picture, call this L. So it's one-dimensional. And then cross that with an n minus one-dimensional axis so you get an n-dimensional example so this is this is it so this is a I'll, I'll call this as a twisted stationary union of half planes for in fact So this has a graph structure, right? This is a Lipschitz two-value graph. Okay, which is so I, I say two-value because it doesn't it doesn't separate into si two single-valued minimal graphs, right? This is sort of a multi. You have to think of stationarity you want to keep that then you can't separate them into 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 simpler pieces so it's not unlike this example this is also two value but you know it's it's two separate single value minimal minimal graphs but this this is not So this is my second example. Now that can that can be a tangent cone to some stationary bar pole. Right? And then third example is is one of these holomorphic varieties is set as a branch point. So these are branched examples. You can take well, we'll use G because this is really a also has a graph structure, one well-known or oh, well-cited example is, is this. This is, this is in C cross C. I think of it as R4. So that's a two-dimensional um, object in, in R4, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's holomorphic. Therefore, it's, it's area minimizing, so it's stationary. So this is this has a, an isolated singularity. At the origin. And it's a branch point. I.e. Tangent cone is a plane with multiplicity, in this case, two. And, and the surface is not immersed at that point. Okay, so again, it's a, you can think of it as a two-value graph over, over z equals zero plane because it's, this is the same as um, z equals plus or minus w to three halves, and, and so it's a graph. It's a C1 alpha, in fact, C1 one half graph, two-value graph. over 
z equals zero. Okay. Now this this actually arises as as a limit of embedded things. You can perturb this. So just g is the limit of g i, where you can um, add a little perturbation term some epsilon i and and then these are embedded okay so in high code dimension this this perfectly nice embedded things can limit to to to, to, to this this degenerate singular picture the, the branch point so you might so that's that might be one reason why you want to study uh, study these singular objects because they do arise in, as limits of embedded guys these are all area minimizing in fact local area minimizing <laughs> okay so and I have one more so this is a this is an example that goes that's pointed out by Lawson and Osselman. So four. This is I think seventy seven. Which is that um so you, you start by the standard half map. which is defined in using complex coordinates. Like this, um, I think of S3 as the sphere in C cross C and S2 as the sphere in R cross C. And so that's the, that's the half map. And then you, you take homogeneous, so you define a function f from R4 into R3 by homogeneously extending this. This is a map on S3. Define f of x as h of x over mod x times mod x. That's a homogeneous extension. And, and it turns out that if you put the right constant here, which is root 5 over 2, in fact, you th this, this is a, so this is a, on four dimensional plane this is a this this solves the minimal surface system so we Lipschitz weak solution to the minimal surface system so this is the And hence, its graph is stationary in the cylinder. Right? So, if you look at the graph, this is a stationary cone in R7. In fact, in the whole space, in fact, R4 cross R3. So, in R7, stationary Lipschitz cone. And obviously it's singular, right? So it's a singular. So this, this gives you an example of a, of a singular cone, stationary cone in four dimensions and in, in, in R7. And in fact, this is, this is the first dimension this sort of thing can happen. So there's a, there's a theorem of Barbosa around the same time. Um, says that this doesn't happen in R3. No non planar Lipschitz graphical or stationary cones, stationary three dimensional cones. 
okay so then if you combine this this result of Barbosa with usual techniques of geometric measure theory um, Armland's weak stratification you do get that result that if you have a, a, a Lipschitz stationary graph then its singular set is co-dimension 4 and minus dimension is at most n minus 4 so so this so combining Barbosa and Allard regularity and Armgrens weak certification so you, you get that It's a shit. So now single value here, right? Single value. Stationary graph. And the house of dimension of the singular set, non embedded points. That's the singular set. Is that more than minus four? Simply because if we do a tangent cone analysis, and if, if a tangent cone is a plane, then it comes with multiplicity one, so all that regulator tells you it's a, it's a regular point. And then Barbosa tells you that this tangent cone, there's nothing until you got four dimensions and therefore um, so the, the translation invariances of the tangent cone can have a subspace of at most n minus four dimensions right? and that then you apply Armgren's general stratification to get that the house two of dimension of, of, the, of the singular that is at most n minus four so so let me just elaborate a little bit on this here. So here, not just going to any stationary um, waterfalls, let's just say, say C is a cone, say C is a stationary integral cone, we'll define S of C, uh, the subspace of translation invariance. This is sitting in some Euclidean space. Just look at the set. In fact, this is this is the set of points where the density of the cone, so the set of points y in the support, such that the density at y is the same as the density. The density at the origin is for a cone is a maximum density. So these are these are all directions that have the same density actually split. It's a, it's a consequence of monotonicity formula. That, so that defines a subspace of translation invariance. And then, um, then you can, so what Armgren's theorem tells you is that, so if, if you have any, so be any stationary integral bar hold, Then you can you can define the strata as J. So these are singular points. Such that the the, the vector space dimension of the subspace S C is at most J. This is true for every tangent cone at that point Y. Okay, so this I'm defining a collection of subsets of the singular set, and it's clear that this is these are increasing in this way. Um, and then what I'm going to tell you is that the, the Hausdorff dimension of this this bit as j is, is at most j. Very clever argument. This is a very simple argument just using 
the monotonicity, in fact, the upper semi continuity of the density function. Um, in an ingenious argument, which is widely used in, in many other many other contexts. So now this so this is how you get n minus four, right? For single valued Lipschitz minimal graphs. Now so so now you go to let's say two valued minimal graphs, just like in this some of this example as I mentioned. You so the obviously by the examples so you know by examples like this we know that the, the dimension bound is the best hope is n minus one, right? For the singular set. of two valued Lipschitz graphs, Lipschitz stationary graphs. So the best hope let's call this graph G that the singular set is at most n minus 1 dimensional. Now the reason this is difficult to prove is because of multiplicity 2 planes, right, as, at, as sort of branch points. So the difficulty here, so Armgren tells you that if you just look at the s n minus 1, that is that has our sort of dimension n minus 1 indeed, right? So the difference of s n minus s n minus 1, that's the bit that's hard, that's difficult to estimate, or remains to be estimated. Right. So, so the difficulty is estimating the house of dimension of Sn minus Sn minus 1. So what, what we want to show that that also, that, that, that's, so, so look at a little bit more closely what, what this set is in this, in this context. This is, this is, this is a set of points um, let's see, so U in Sn, which means that there is, um, so by this definition, you are in Sn but not in Sn minus 1. That means there is at least one tangent plane, right, plane, translation invariance is all directions. Now, it has to come with multiplicity to go higher by Allard regularity, right? So this is really the set of singular points such that there is a plane P with so I'm, I'm looking at the two-valued case, so therefore two-valued Lipschitz case. So when you take a tangent cone, it remains Lipschitz, um, two-valued. So what we're really looking at is two times this plane is, is a tangent cone. Okay? So what we need to understand is, is at points where there is, a, there is at least one tangent cone which is two times the plane. Okay. Now, so I'm not going to answer this question today, but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you some things about um, a sort of a detailed picture at, at such a point, right? much, much more than just lip sheets. In fact, there's a C1 alpha picture near there.
So, um, yeah, I could I could now state some theorems. So some results. Let me sort of group them in kind of three, three statements. Theorem A. So this is this is Spencer Becker Kant's work. It's his thesis, in fact. Um, so the setting is that we have f, which is on some domain in Rn. So it's a, it's a two-valued graph. So I'll, I'll use this notation to indicate the space of unordered vectors in Rk. Right? So this is um, this is the space we need to describe branching behavior, like like in that example, because things don't separate into two separate minimal graphs. So, so we're going to look at maps into, into this set. And, and we'll assume that this is Lipschitz. So omega is open. Uh, and f is Lipschitz. And the graph is stationary. So graph stationary in the cylinder. I'll make cross OK. Right, so this is the only assumption, stationarity. And no variationally, that's the only assumption. And then so you take a point x naught. be in the graph. Um, so x naught is such that one tangent cone So one t we're going to assume that one tangent cone at x naught is is either a pair of transverse planes or, or one of those twisted examples, right? So this is that's that's the assumption. So one tangent cone is a pair of transverse planes. Intersecting along any pot potentially lower dimensional subspace or a twisted union of half planes. Okay, so those guys meet along an n minus one dimensional axis because twisting can only happen if the cross section is one D. So so then then the, 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 the conclusion is that in a whole neighborhood all tangents are of that type. They're unique, all of them. And we have, and also have estimates decaying to those C1 alpha estimates. That's what Spencer proved. say are of the same type. Oh, 
Oh, of course, multiplicity one plane, right? At regular points. But high multiplicity doesn't happen, right? That's uh, part of the conclusion. And also, neither does anything like Lawson Osborne singularities near such a point. So it's a very clean picture here. And plus, C1 alpha decay estimates. Let me not write down that in detail, but somehow the, when you rescale the graph, it, it decays to near one of the tangent counts, it decays in a C1 alpha way to the to the unique. Could you, yeah. could you just then say that it is actually a C1 alpha graph? It is, the, well, because of the, okay, so it's, it's in a generalized sense, because you, because you can, potentially you can have these twisted uh, singularities, twisted right? So on each side is C1 alpha, but they don't make yeah, up. Yeah, but they don't right. Yeah, modulo that it is, right, right. So, yeah. Yeah, the, the estimates are uniform enough to say that, mm -hmm. correct. So this is, uh, so then, uh, so this is sort of the first step in understanding bran so branch points, right? So the question is multiplicity two planes, what, what can you say near such, such points? Yeah. So about theorem A. Yes. Uh, the assumption that you get at x naught these two kinds of uh, tangent cones, right? Yes. Are there other examples in mind of possibilities or? Uh, um, you mean? What's the point? I mean that uh, there could be other examples of possible tangent cones. Yes, like Lawson Elselman. For instance, you could have, okay. see, see the what's not a priori is, I mean, there's nothing, okay, you're assuming it's a Lipschitz graph, but really you should think of that as an assumption, more sort of a topological assumption than anything about the, the, the singular structure or the singularities. Mm -hmm. Because you can get this conical, I mean, lots and lots of examples, um, they, they do exist, right? They, they, so that could be, so there could be a sequence of such things, for instance, converge a priori, right? These conical guys converging to a point where the tangent cone is transverse planes, right? There's nothing preventing that a priori, right? So there's no restriction in the assumption that, well, a priori there's, it's not clear how you are restricting the singular behavior. Yeah, no, no, um, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. My question is just, what are other possible examples of tangent cones at the point x naught? I mean, how strict is the assumption of this theorem about the point x naught? Um, well, you could have multiplicity two plane. You, you could, I mean, you could you could start by any with any tangent cone. You can ask the same question. What is that? Okay. So multiplicity two could be probably the simplest next example. Right. Okay. In fact, that, that is actually you as you expect it to be somewhat more involved, right? You're trying to understand this degeneration, degenerate singularities. <coughs> so, so it's you can think of this as a kind of a first step towards that. So where you have multiplicity to tangent count, and then you can see you, you can imagine a transverse picture degenerating with that picture, like, like in that example. Um, okay, in this example, it's isolated, but you can easily construct with transverse uh, singular, right? Yeah. So so this trans the, this kind of singularities can limit on that kind of branch point. And you know, plus a priori, you know, plus anything, you know, anything. could be pretty wild, right? Yeah, a priori. Okay. Um, so, by the way, I, I mean, if you have, so, uh, right, so if you just think about this isolated single example, that that is unique, but that's Leon Simon's theorem, right? You can apply that to, to, to show that. but. We don't really know enough examples, in fact, to, to say how bad. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So, so um, anyway. So, at, at least this this theorem rules out this this particular this kind of conical conical example conical singularities near near that point. So, so then, so the next next um, theorem is, is more more recent work. So 
So I'll call this theorem B. This is again this joint work with Spencer. Ah, this is these two names here. That's one. It's not that. Um, there I put this date. It's sort of nearly finished, but right. Right, so, so th th this is now addressing the, the branch point case. So, so suppose, so hypothesis as in A. Let's say G as in A. Now we're going to take a point X naught where one tangent cone is, a, is supported on a plane. So, so it's just it's like 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 that example so that up there, like a branch point example. And the conclusion is 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 similar. In fact, all tangent cones are unique, so there exists a unique. So there is a neighborhood x naught such that in which all tangents are unique. And are uh, uh, planes of now multiplicity two one or two or or, or as in, in the previous uh, theorem or transverse pairs of planes. Or twisted half planes. Again with estimates. Right. So, so that's that's. I I want to kind of. Uh, focus on, on this in, in a bit, but, uh, but let me just also, I, what I want to do is sort of kind of focus on a sort of circle of ideas that, 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 that have been kind of worked out in the past few years to, to you know, get results like this. And, and th this, this can be also applied, see in code dimension one, you could, you could drop the assumption of Lipschitz graph in favor of stability of the regular part. So same sort of thing holds. So let me just also point that out before I get back to this theorem. Theorem C. So let me not put a date on this because it's somehow something I've known actually for for a while now. Uh, but um, um, it's not clear when that will get get written down. It's a funny situation. I don't know who to blame for that. But <laughs> 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 uh, 
it's something I've kind of known, but then you know, some of the ideas have been used in all these other things, and now it's not clear how to, how to proceed. <laughs> so here now, what we're going to assume is <laughs> we use stationary. Of course, OK, let, let me just give the statement first, and then I'll make some comments. Um, so we use just a stationary integral. n bar port in an open set in Rn plus 1. Now we're in co-dimension 1. And suppose that the regular part, which we know by all our regularity, it is there, right? It is, it is, it is a dense subset, um, a dense open subset. of the support. So it could be very small in measure, right? That's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's really the state of affairs. Just stationarity doesn't tell you anything about the measure of the singular set. So, so but we're going to assume nevertheless, in potentially this very small bit, it's, it's stable, right? So the regular part is stable. So perturbations that stay away from the singular set with respect to those perturbations, normal variations, everything makes sense. You're on the regular set. Uh, second variation is non-negative. Um, let's see, right? So that's it. So then, then you take any point where there's a multiplicity to, uh, let me see. Let's let me say this. Yeah, so, so suppose x node is a point with a multiplicity 2 tangent cone, tangent plane. So one tangent cone is a multiplicity 2 plane. And then, <coughs> so the same, same conclusions hold. Now in a whole neighborhood, the, all tangent cones are unique and they're either multiplicity two planes or now generally pairs of transverse planes. There's twisting doesn't happen, right? Because you're in co-dimension one. So then. You need, um, Uh, pairs of planes possibly with uh, pairs of transverse planes I guess over multiplicity two planes oh of course multiplicity one planes Ah, right. No, yes, I knew I was forgetting something. You need an extra assumption here, um, which I'm not sure if it's necessary, but um, the assumption is that, that near, near x naught there are no points of density 3 halves. So this, is, this x naught has density 2, so, and density is only upper semi-continuous, so you might wonder you know, if there could be a density 3 halves, sequence of density 3 halves points converging to that. I don't know if that can happen, but it needs, it's an assumption in the field that there are no such. So, a density of B at Y is not equal to 3 halves for Y near X naught. So, so, okay, let, let me make a sort of a quick sort of remark about this, this assumption. In fact, so th this is, I mean, there's an estimate here that, that gives you these conclusions, which is that in a neighborhood under these assumptions, 
So there's an epsilon regularity result with an estimate. So theorem C and in fact theorem uh, B as well. Followed from epsilon regularity. Theorem which says that if uh, V is close to a multiplicity two plane, then it satisfies a C1 alpha decay. Estimate de de uh, so this is this is an abstract so we are assuming it's close to a multiplicity two plane right there's no assumption that there's a tangent cone of multiplicity two uh, plane so you could you could it could look like this for instance where this is this might be a transverse pair of planes this is a tangent cone um, so that's a, meant to be a transverse picture here. And that's allowed with a small angle here. This is a plane P. But so nevertheless, so you have the C1 alpha decay estimate possibly decaying to a plane or a trans or a pair of planes. Okay, in, in the case of theorem, theorem C. Now, and, and in fact, so, and V and G is a, yeah, V, I guess I call it V, right? Yeah, V is, in fact. So once you prove this, this decay estimate at, 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 at the origin, then you can move base point and usual sort of argument tells you that V is, in fact, a C1 alpha two valued graph. Yeah, in a neighborhood. Why, sorry, yeah. why can't you? Why then can you exclude the uh, pair of? Uh, no, I mean the, the four twisted half plates nearby. Co-dimension one. Ah, co-dimension one. Yeah. Ah, okay. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ah, so in theorem B, you will have the same, but. With yeah. Yeah. Two right. Two, uh, yeah. Two. Then you have to allow that, right? As a, yeah. Then this is kind of generalized. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Like it could be close. It could be close, yeah. Right. Now, the interesting thing is that, so as I said, this theorem, so th th this <coughs> statement is actually false, <laughs> strangely enough, without this assumption. In fact, it's also false if we have three values. So everything is kind of sharp as far as this. Um, this epsilon regularity theorem is concerned. It's kind of strange because I mean you can do this kind of silly. So for for multiplicity three, you could just take a catenoid like this and put a plane through here. So that's your V. It's stable on the regular set because this regular set is a graph. This is this is going through the and the waste of the catenoid. And then, of course, by scaling this down, you can, you're arbitrarily close to, to a plane, but it is not a C1 alpha graph, three value graph. Okay. So it's a sort of a silly, silly, silly picture, in fact. <laughs> but um, also, you could do the following. So, regarding the assumption three halves, you could, um, so you could take, you start with the catenary, which is, Um, do it like that, and so this is one dimensional now, right? In, on the plane, this curve, it gives you the cat node when you rotate. Um, but now, now look at a point where you have this angle is 120 degrees. Okay, and then um, so take this piece.
and then uh, then rotate and then and then double it so so you get a picture let me move this down now here sort of like this now this is a 2d picture looks like this and because it's angle condition this is stationary here And you're giving this multiplicity one here, okay? This is this is taken with multiplicity one. So everything is multiplicity one here. And now, so this obviously, this is the cat node. So, you know, you can scale this down and make it arbitrarily flat. Right? And there is a sequence of density three half points. That's the problem. That's the reason why it's not becoming two, two graphs. Okay. And, and obviously this assumption is an assumption that would be satisfied if, if you were for is a, is a, uh, corresponds to a current, for instance, because, uh, um, you know, that some cases it can be checked, but in any case, it, it's kind of strange that you seem to it seem to be. Uh, it is necessary for for the epsilon regularity, but I'm not sure. If, I don't know if it is necessary for the theorem. Okay, right. So I guess seven minutes left. Let me now tell you what I really wanted to tell you, <laughs> which is kind of the proof. Uh, some aspects of the proof of theorem B. See, from my maybe geometrically, maybe this is probably the nicer theorem because it doesn't assume graphs and so on. However, more difficult theorem is actually B. From an analytic point of view, and um, so I'll, I'll take the uh, the speaker's liberty and, and kind of focus on what I like, which is theorem the analysis. So, um, so some uh, one key aspect. Proof of theorem B. Okay. So this is in high core dimension. We have a Lipschitz graph. We are trying to understand decay at a point where the, there's a one uh, it's a, where it's Okay, so decay but subject to the condition that is close to multiplicity two plane. So we want to prove epsilon regularity. So, so we are going to assume that that the distance, so L two distance to some plane, maybe I call it P of this graph. In a ball, let's say, if this is small, we want to prove that there is decay. At the origin, let's assume the origin is in the support. And, and the usual procedure for this understanding this sort of thing is, well, thing you want to somehow try is, is to linearize this, right? So the, this, is, this is the standard method, going back to Di Giorgi, Allard, and Leon Simon in the singular case. So, so we like to understand. Um, so so to, to, to prove something like this, we, we take a sequence GI with this quantity tending to zero, this excess, um, and and let, let's orient everything so there's a fixed plane that it is converging to. So GI converging to. Two times, let's say R n, and then then we want to produce. So we want to we want to blow up by this E j to produce a Jacobi field 
over over this. So that's the So, so produce. So you can l l let me just denote by f y tilde. There's a Lipschitz approximation with small Lipschitz constant and so on. That goes. That comes from Alan Armgren's work. That I'll call that f y tilde. This is the thing you you blow up. <coughs> so you get v, which is two valued. Okay. You could do this coordinate wise, for instance, right? Just to produce this. So, so this is sort of a weak, so it's a doubly one to convergence here. Local. And L2. Okay, so, so you get two valued function over Rn. Now, the, so if you, if you think about how the LR regularity works in multiplicity one case this is easy to see that this is a harmonic function and therefore homogeneous Jacobi fields are linear right? homogeneous degree one harmonic functions are linear so so the key to this is we want to understand so if, let's call f the blow up class this Jacobi fields arising V rising in this way, which means that I'm taking all possible all sequences of these two value graphs converging to multiplicity planes, and you do this procedure that produces a class of functions. V, I'm going to call that class F. Now the, the, the key to understand so we want to prove an estimate for this this V first. Okay. Now, in, in previous cases where multiplicity is one, in all, all cases, including Leon Simon's work, where you, you do this over a singular cone rather than a plane, it's still assuming multiplicity one. That means that Jacobi fields satisfy a PDE. It's an equation. In our regular, this is the Laplace equation. Right? So then you can, you know, there's PDE techniques that's available to understand homogeneous elements. But here is the two valued thing. There could be a large branch set. There's no restriction on the singular set, including the branch points. So this, this need not separate anywhere locally, a priori, into two separate harmonic functions. That's the difficulty. So we want to understand, we want to show that the homogeneous Jacobi fields, homogeneous degree one, Jacobi fields are either um, linear functions, pair, uh, a pair of linear functions, or twisted, this twisted picture, right? Twisted half planes. Right? This is the this is the assertion. Now this this what this is saying is that this integrability can in a kind of fancy language is saying that integrability is satisfied in this context. Homogeneous Jacobi fields are obtained by switching or like rotating planes, nothing nothing else. Um, now, as I said, there's no PDE. Okay, so you can use PDE in some cases, but there's no very direct uh, PDE theory that you can apply to directly, unlike in the multiplicity one cases. So you need to find a tool to, to do this, and, 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 and the tool is this great discovery from Armgren, which is the frequency function. So in this last minute, let me just, so the key tool to proving this Show monotonicity. Okay. 
of Amgren's frequency function um, for any homogeneous degree one. Jacobi field. We just do, we, I'm not claiming that there is a priori a monotonicity for holes for any blow up. I'm only focusing on homogeneous degree one guys. Now, the, the, because I'm just doing bare minimum necessary mi uh, minimum. And, and to do that, so if I call this V, we, we want to first show that V is C1 away from um, its spine. This is translation. There's some number of translation invariant directions. Just stay away from that. This is a qualitative step. Th this requires a lot of work to do, but, but that's, that's true. Again, I'm using homogeneity here. This is an inductive argument. Somehow, some of the ideas go back to my work on stable hypersurfaces. Yeah, proving this. And, and then, second is that there's an interesting energy estimate, actually. This is now general, actually, not. not um, okay, I said, okay, so homogeneity is used for one. And then in two, actually, it's general that, that the, um, if you take out the average, then the, then the look at the set where we, this difference is less than delta. This energy is bounded by C delta. This, this is actually works in very in general. This is this, this holds in, in for any blow up of stationary variables. Of any multiplicity, in fact. Could be multiplicity Q. This is a this is a, in the end it's actually not that difficult to prove, but somehow realizing this uh, um, this was sort of key to, to the, our, our proof of this classification theorem for homogeneous degree one guys. Now once you have this this control on the and the energy whenever V is close to the average. Now, in the homogeneous case, VA, you can assume VA is zero, right? Because it's planar, you can take it away. Because it's harmonic, VA is always harmonic. Um, then that gets fed into the key variational identity you have to check in order to prove monotonicity. I had hoped to explain this last step, but I'm out of time, so let me just write it down. So then back to homogeneous. So this is this this is very general, but then back to homogeneous guys. It satisfies assume V is zero. This uh, familiar identity from harmonic maps. This is this is true for every vector field. Um, compactly supported vector field. And in, in checking this, you, you, you use these two things. You analyze this part of that contribution near the branch set where you, so it's a, it's a cutoff function argument you have. You like to, in, um, what you like to do is integrate by parts. Right? There's no variational principle that these blow up satisfy a priori. Right? In Armgren setting, these are energy minimizing. If you blow up area minimizers, you get energy minimizers, so you use variational identity. But here you just try to integrate by paths. But you don't have second derivatives. You only have first derivatives. Okay? So you have to, that's the reason why you have to cut off basis where the thing becomes zero, and then you need to control how much energy is contributing from those regions. That's where this, that's, I mean, you know, Okay, so that's anyway, roughly that's the that's sort of the thing. Once you understand homogeneous guys, then it's easy to show that the blow up satisfy a decay estimate, and then that translates into decay estimate for the for the graph. Okay, sorry, I went over.